This week I participated in a debate over the proposition gender identity should replace sex in policy. This talk is a copy of my presentation and there's an additional section at the end of the talk that expands a bit on, um, on part of it. I'm arguing that gender identity should not replace sex in policy. I'll start with some local context, which is that in Victoria, gender identity has in fact replaced sex in the law and in quite a bit of policy. In the rest of my time, I'll argue that gender identity should not replace sex in policy because doing so would compromise important interests. I'll establish this by working through a number of concrete real examples. And then in the last part of the talk, I'll turn to a procedural question, which is how the replacement of sex with gender identity should be allowed to come about if it's going to. Because things didn't happen this way in Victoria, I'll suggest that the situation we're currently in is unjust. So first, some brief background about the situation in Victoria. Before May this year, a person could change their legal sex, which means the record of their sex in the birth register, only if they had undergone sex reassignment surgery. Or to use the wording from the superseded version of the act, only if they had undergone a surgical procedure involving the alteration of a person's reproductive organs carried out for the purpose of assisting the person to be considered a member of the opposite sex. The Births, Deaths and Marriages Registration Amendment Bill 2019, for short the BDMRA, removed that requirement and replaced it with an acknowledgement of sex application. This application simply requires a statutory declaration to the effect that one believes one's sex to be as nominated. So for example, a male person applying to have his legal sex changed to female must make a statutory declaration saying he believes he is female. The application also needs a supporting statement from one other person saying that the application is being made in good faith and that the person supports it. And such applications can be made as often as once a year. The only general gatekeeping requirement in the bill is that the alteration of the record of sex is not sought for a fraudulent or other improper purpose. There are some specific restrictions too for detainees, prisoners, prisoners on parole, offenders and registrable offenders. They are allowed to make applications, but there is an extra layer of approval required from specified officials. The bill also proposed an amendment to the Corrections Act, stating that the relevant official must not approve the application if they think the change of sex would be reasonably likely to be regarded as offensive by a victim of crime or an appreciable sector of the community. So this allows, for example, that a man convicted of rape or other violence against women could be denied a change of legal sex on the grounds that it would be offensive to his female victims. So the bill passed and it came into effect on the 1st of May this year, and the relevant amendments to the other acts have also been made. Separate of it being this easy to change legal sex in Victoria, gender identity is also a protected attribute in our our Equal Opportunity Act, which means there are anti-discrimination protections on its basis whether or not there is a legal change of sex. So another way to say this is that a person with a gender identity is legally protected in a range of cases whether or not he also chooses to become legally female. But because there are no other requirements for making an acknowledgement of sex application than the Declaration of Belief, for example, no requirement of physical transition, social transition, length of time living as the opposite sex, diagnosis of gender dysphoria, or anything else that is objective rather than subjective, the Victorian category of sex is essentially now tracking gender identity. So who are the people that have gender identities? It's important to say something about how I'm thinking about this to avoid misunderstandings. So replacing sex with gender identity in policy creates a different constituency for all previously sex segregated provisions, unless that is explicitly protected against. These two groups will overlap, but they'll have some differences. And the difference is in whether people with gender identities are included in the category of their sex or in a category of their identity. So take a trans man, for example. 
if we divide some provision based on sex, so for example, uh, having an earlier age of retirement, then the trans man will be in the female slash woman category. But if we divide that provision based on gender identities, then the trans man will be in the male slash man category. It's easy to think of trans, including non-binary people, as people with gender identities and assume that this has always been the case. It hasn't. It's a reasonably new way of thinking about transness that has changed the group of people considered to be trans considerably. So compare the group gay people. This means people who are same-sex attracted. This underlying trait has never changed. There may be some more gay people now than there were in the past, but this is likely because there is less homophobia, so more people are comfortable being out as gay. But if we go back to trans, we can see that the underlying trait itself has changed a lot as trans politics became expansionist, drawing more people in. In the 1960s through the late 1980s, to be trans was to be transsexual, and the population was almost entirely male people with extremely strong feelings about their sexed bodies being wrong, who wanted to transition surgically, medically, and socially to live as women. Some passed as women and some did not, but all were clearly attempting to be read as feminine. This category has an underlying trait, something like severe dysphoria about the sexed body. And that is no longer the underlying trait. So a 2015 report from the United States on 27,715 transgender people found that the number of trans women, which is biological males who identify as women, who had undergone sex reassignment surgery was 12%. That means 88% had not, so in other words, were transgender but not transsexual. People with severe dysphoria about the sexed body are likely to have surgery in much higher numbers than this. For trans men, which is biological females who identify as men, the numbers were slightly higher, with 36% having had breast reductions or double mastectomies, which is the most common type of surgery for trans men. But breasts are a secondary, not a primary sex characteristic. Only 14% of trans men had had hysterectomies, which suggests that nearly all trans men are transgender, but not transsexual. So the underlying trait has shifted. Later, there were movements to queer gender categories and to reject the binary thinking that said transition meant moving from one sex category into the other as far as possible. Today, some people are attracted to trans, including non-binary identities as political statements. There has been a dramatic change in the population from mostly male back then to large numbers of female uh, people today. Worryingly large numbers, um, some people think, myself included. There has been a reconceptualization of people previously not considered trans to now being considered as trans, including cross-dressers, drag artists, third gender people, and all gender non-conforming people. Many trans people reject any form of surgical or medical transition and reject the idea of needing to pass as the opposite sex. Some trans people do not change anything except their pronouns and the category they claim to belong to. Researchers have worried that gender identities are having a social contagion effect and that high numbers of autistic people, gay people and people with body image issues relating to sexist objectification are being attracted to identifying as trans as an apparent solution to their problems. The reason I mention this change to the population is so that there can be no misunderstanding that when we're talking about including people with gender identities into the sex categories they identify with, this may be on the basis of nothing more than a claim about pronouns or a claim about feeling more feminine than masculine. There should be no assumption of the person passing as the sex, having ever been treated as the sex, ever suffering the social disadvantages relating to the way that people of that sex are treated, having any understanding of the social and political issues of that sex, and so on. Some people with gender identities might have more common experience with people of the sex they identify with, 
But if we thought those things were relevant, then we'd be talking about, for example, replacing sex with assumed sex or sexed social treatment. But we're not. We're debating replacing sex with gender identity. And for that discussion, it has to be the identity alone that is doing the work. Of course, if sex categories don't matter at all, then we have no reason not to change how we categorize people. We might as well shift to gender identity or even get rid of sex slash gender related categories altogether. So what we need to establish is whether sex categories do matter. And I'll spend most of the rest of my time on that question. It'll be easiest to approach this question by identifying the multiple levels where sex matters. So these are international, national and local. I'll give some examples at each level of where sex matters and would be compromised by a shift to gender identity. And this list is not meant to be exhaustive. It's only meant to be indicative. At the international level, the most important bit of law is the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, 1979, or for short, CEDAW, which notes that despite various legal instruments existing to uphold the equality of men and women, discrimination against women continues to exist. It is clear that CEDAW understands woman as a sex, for example, referring to the social significance of maternity and the role of women in procreation, defining discrimination against women as distinction, exclusion or restriction made on the basis of sex, talking about the prevention of discrimination against women in employment, particularly relating to pregnancy and maternity leave, and talking about pregnancy and lactation. Replacing sex with gender identity in international law would make CEDAW incoherent. In fact, it would make it objectionable because gender identity activists could complain, as they have been doing elsewhere, that it is objectionable to tie the word woman to these facts about women's biology. And they could demand that all of these references be taken out of the convention so that it is inclusive of women who are biologically male or women with penises, if you prefer. But so long as we think it's true that existing human rights instruments have failed to protect women equally, understood as female people, then we will want to have international conventions like CEDAW in place. Of course, a simple solution would be to simply keep sex and gender identity distinct, perhaps using some other word than woman to refer to people who self-identify as women, so that there would be no confusion about who CEDAW was designed to protect and no possible objection that it was excluding anyone. But many activists for gender identity are not happy with that compromise. They want sex replaced, not merely supplemented with additional protections. And in any case, that's not the proposition that we're debating here. I won't keep raising this possible compromise for every further consideration, but it is always there as an alternative to replacement that I think we would do well to consider. At the international level, there is also policy falling short of law to consider. So World Rugby, for example, just came out with the recommendation that transgender women be excluded from playing in elite women's rugby because of the safety risks that poses to women. After extensive research and consultation, they found that women players are at a 20 to 30% greater risk of injuries when tackled by someone who has gone through a male puberty. World Rugby, thankfully, I think, refused to replace sex with gender identity in their policy. But the International Olympic Committee policy is that trans women may compete in women's sports categories so long as their testosterone levels are below 10 nanomoles per litre for at least 12 months. This completely ignores the physiological advantages that are gained from going through a male puberty and focuses instead on levels of testosterone at a time. In addition, women's testosterone levels in the normal healthy range are 0 to 1.7 nanomoles per litre. So the level allowed for trans women is nearly six times higher than the upper limit of that range. Replacing sex with gender identity in international sporting policy would make that policy inclusive of trans women at a serious cost to women. Women, understood as a sex class, have been excluded from and underrepresented in sport. 
women were only allowed to compete in the Boston Marathon for the first time in 1972. It is an ongoing fight to get women and girls involved in sport and to attract funding and audiences to women's sport. There is estimated to be a roughly 10% performance gap between men and women when it comes to strength and speed. A woman who has trained hard all her life in a sport, who is then forced to compete against someone who has gone through a male puberty, is not on a level playing field. I think it is significant if even one such athlete loses a sports scholarship on that basis, or her place in the Olympic team, or leaves the sport because she is frustrated by the unfairness. So this is not just a matter of big enough numbers destroying women's sports entirely by sneaking men in through the back door of inclusion policy and effectively making all sports male dominated, whether they're called women's sports or men's sports. It is about that too, but even in small numbers, the harms to the women who are injured or who lose places that were rightfully theirs are significant too. We should not replace sex with gender identity in sporting policy. If we're going to let trans women compete in the women's category, then it should be only those trans women who did not go through a male puberty, and even then, only depending on our best science, not eventually establishing that they too have a performance advantage from, for example, testosterone exposure in the womb. But the broad category of gender identity can make no such distinctions between different types of transitions. Let's drop down to the national level. The Federal Level Sex Discrimination Act, for short SDA, protects people against discrimination on the basis of sex. The 1984 Act, before the 2013 amendments, defined both man and woman. Woman was a member of the female sex, irrespective of age, and man was a member of the male sex, irrespective of age. The amendments took these definitions out, and in the current SDA, neither sex nor gender are defined. The most significant change is that gender identity was added. Sex discrimination is understood as covering sex, characteristics that people of the sex generally have, and characteristics that people of the sex are generally thought to have. Although, because sex is not defined, it is not entirely clear what is meant here. Gender identity covers gender identity, defined in an unhelpful way as the gender-related identity, appearance, or mannerisms, or other gender-related characteristics of a person, whether by way of medical intervention or not, with or without regard to the person's designated sex at birth. And I say it's unhelpful because if we don't know what gender is, then it's not helpful to define gender identity in relation to it, and gender is not defined. The upshot is that federal law that was designed to protect against sex discrimination has now been amended, so that it does not define the sexes, and so that it protects gender identity too. In the explanatory memorandum, it is explained that the definitions have been removed, but will take their ordinary meaning and that the intention of repealing them was in order to ensure that man and woman are not interpreted so narrowly as to exclude, for example, a transgender woman from accessing protections from discrimination on the basis of other attributes contained in the SDA. That makes perfect sense if we're thinking about transsexuals or transgender people who have transitioned surgically or medically and so actually have or would be assumed to have, in virtue of looking female, some of the attributes of females. Because sex discrimination covers not just sex, but specific sex characteristics like breasts and characteristics people of the sex generally have, someone who is perceived to be female when they are technically male will sometimes need these protections. If he is sexually harassed in comments made about his breasts, or if he is subject to workplace discrimination because it is assumed that he is at risk of becoming pregnant and so needing maternity pay, then he should be covered under sex discrimination legislation. The problem is what to make of all the exemptions. The SDA specifies that we can sometimes exclude on the basis of sex in a way that does not count as discrimination. This includes cases where sex is relevant to employment, where it is a genuine occupational requirement to be of a particular sex, where the position requires particular physical attributes that only one sex has, where it is required in dramatic performances for reasons of authenticity, 
aesthetics or tradition, where it preserves decency or privacy because the position requires the fitting of clothes to people of one sex, where the position requires entering the bathrooms of people of one sex, where the position requires a living and there aren't sex separated sleeping accommodations and bathrooms, and where the position requires the person to go into changing areas used by people of one sex, where they'll be in a position of undress. So for example, a play can refuse to cast a man in a woman's role. A women's lingerie store can refuse to hire a male shop assistant. A women's swimming centre can refuse to hire male cleaners. A women's boarding school can refuse to hire a male teacher if there are only shared sleeping accommodations and shared showers for the existing all-women staff. But what do these exemptions mean if the same employers, casting directors and so on, can't refuse to hire men with gender identities? Can any man circumvent these exemptions and impose himself so long as he claims to have a gender identity? According to the letter of the federal law, he absolutely can. Settling this matter will probably have to be left to the courts. If these laws were drafted with transsexual people rather than merely self-declared transgender people in mind, then it may come as a surprise to the court when a fully male-bodied and male-appearing person claiming to be a woman brings a discrimination case against an employer for refusing to hire him into a female-only role. If the courts let him get away with this, then the original purpose of the SDA has been partially undermined. It's not that female people aren't protected against discrimination on the basis of sex anymore. They are. It's rather that exemptions that permitted some things to be sex differentiated, which can advance particular interests that women have, are compromised. For example, not having male attendants at the women's swimming pool may mean more women are comfortable swimming there, and this may bring goods related to health and fitness, community, and more. The greater the numbers of men who claim to have gender identities, the more of a problem this will be. And as we talked about earlier, because this seems to be an expansionist category, the numbers may keep rising. There are a few other examples at the national level that I don't have time to say as much about, but I at least wanted to mention. These are prison policy, census data, and the language used by women's organizations. So prison estates are sex segregated, and this protects an important range of interests that women have. For example, it makes them less likely to be subject to rape and sexual assault. Women on average commit far less violent crime than men and far, far less sex crime. If we shift to gender identity rather than sex for prison policy, then we compromise women's safety and we create incentives for male prisoners to start identifying as women, which is already happening in the UK. We might want to have a conversation about something that is neither sex nor gender identity for prison policy, such as housing transsexual women in the female estate and non-transsexual transgender in the male estate, or having a separate wing for transgender prisoners, or not allowing any man who has committed violence against women into the women's prison, but treating all other men who identify as women on a case-by-case -case basis with women's safety held firmly in mind. There are a lot of possible policy options, but simply declaring trans women are vulnerable in the men's prison without any regard for women prisoners' safety and interest, which is what gender identity activists tend to do, is unacceptable. So we should not replace sex with gender identity in prison policy. In Scotland, there is currently a discussion happening about the census, because there has traditionally been a question about sex. But there has been an attempt by activists to have the sex question replaced by a question about gender identity. Researchers have pointed out that sex is one of the most important variables in sociological research, and that there are very often sex differences in the outcomes we're interested to measure. If we replace sex with gender identity in the census, or in any other data gathering, then we lose information that is important, and we become unable to track sex-related outcomes. Given that we know there are sex-based differences in outcomes, for example, that there are less women in full-time work, losing this data would compromise our ability to track the progress we were making toward improving outcomes for women. The numbers matter here, 
So if the numbers of people with gender identities are absolutely tiny, then there will be so much overlap between the answers we get when we ask about sex as opposed to gender identity that there won't be enough distortion of the data to worry about. But anywhere that we're tracking outcomes that involve small numbers, this would still matter. And sex actually matters even within trans communities. So for example, if we only collected information about self-identified men and self-identified women, then data specifically about trans men would be drowned out in the data about men. And data specifically about non-binary people would make invisible the differences between female and male non-binary people. But these differences are significant. A recent Australian study found that trans people are at increased risk of sexual violence, but it's female non-binary people who are at the greatest risk of all, and it's trans men who are at the next highest risk. These facts are compatible with an intersectional approach to sexual violence, where female people are at risk, and then being trans exacerbates that risk. If we treat all non-binary people as one category and roll trans men together with men who have low experience of sexual violence, we won't know that these serious negative outcomes exist and we won't be in a position to work on them. In everyone's interest, we should not replace sex with gender identity in data collection, in the census and also anywhere else that sex can be expected to make a difference. This includes crime reporting data, where it is already happening that crimes virtually never perpetrated by women, like possession of child pornography, are being attributed to women because the man who did them identifies as a woman. Finally, the example of gender-neutral language in women's organisations. For example, Mary Stopes Australia recently shared a post about abortion, asking who has abortions, and answering men with uteruses, people who already have children, people with a wanted pregnancy, and people who use contraception. Or in another example from the same organisation, a post during Women's Health Week claimed that women's genitals come in all shapes, sizes and colours, and included an image of a penis. This is a direct consequence of a shift from sex to gender identity in understanding women's health issues. Now, women's health is not just about women, but also about men, because they identify as women. At least the abortion post had the sense to stick to people actually capable of getting pregnant and needing abortions, while the women's genitals post just gave up sex altogether. The first is an attempt to be inclusive of trans men and non-binary females, while the second is an attempt to be inclusive of trans women. Whether this is good depends on whether you think there are women's health issues relating to their sexed bodies that deserve women's organisation's focus without being diluted to include populations that are already well serviced. I personally think that adding language to make clear that trans men and female non-binary people are included is a good thing, and that covering trans women is silly because there is little to no overlap in their health concerns and women's. The problem is that gender identity activists lobbying for gender neutral language, even when intended to include people who are female but don't identify as women, risks a loss to women. That's because language has historically been male centred and assumed in a kind of hand wavy way to also cover women. We talked about man and apparently meant humankind, and we defaulted to male pronouns. Our default human was male. This default is still causing all sorts of problems in research, medicine, design, and other areas today. Women-centered language is an important challenge and remedy to the default male, but the gender-neutral language movement displaces women-centered language. It does so with a different intention, not sexism, but inclusion. But it doesn't make sense to include the next marginalised group by compromising the progress that the last marginalised group has made. We should find a way to retain women-centred language and include female people who don't identify as women. So gender identity should not replace sex in the policy that sets the language of women's organisations. Dropping down again to the state level, there is the Victorian Equal Opportunity Act, for short the EOA. The structure is roughly the same here as for the national SDA. The state EOA protects against discrimination on the grounds of a number of protected attributes, of which sex and gender identity are included. 
As with the SDA, sex is not defined. The EOA also offers exemptions where it is okay to exclude on the basis of sex, but the only case where it is noted as okay to exclude on the basis of sex and gender identity is elite sport. That implies that for all the other sex exemptions, it is not okay to exclude on the basis of gender identity. So just as for the SDA, important exemptions that serve women's interests stand to be compromised by being made mixed sex. These include genuine occupational requirements, educational institutions, insurance, welfare measures, student accommodation, sexual services accommodation, clubs, and religious schools. This means an all-girls school could end up being subject to a complaint for violation of the EOA because it refused to admit someone clearly a boy because he claimed to identify as a girl. And finally, we can drop down yet again to the level of the city and think about all the companies, organizations, clubs, teams, and so on that operate within it. We've talked already about sports, which raises issues for all the local sports that are currently sex segregated and which provide a pipeline into elite sports. Another important example is the policy of local health clinics and hospitals. At the moment, you can ask for a female doctor or dentist or surgeon. There may not be one available and you may have to decide whether to compromise, but you can ask and your request is generally respected. If these places all adopt a policy of gender identity rather than sex, then they won't recognize the differences between a woman doctor who is female and one that is a man merely identifying as a woman. And that compromises the female patient's right to request a doctor, dentist or surgeon of the same sex, which she would be more comfortable with. This can be particularly important for women who have been sexually assaulted by men. These are just a few of the many examples where sex matters at all these different levels and an attempt to show that replacing sex with gender identity is far from obviously a good idea in any, let alone all of these places. There are good reasons to resist the changes at all of these levels, I think. Note that some of the plausible underlying rationales for sex segregation, like protecting women's safety and privacy, advancing affirmative action, and collecting data in order to monitor progress, uh, none of these are plausibly served by the inclusion of merely self-identifying trans women, by which I mean someone who has transitioned in no other way than declaring himself a woman. There might be some instances where trans women who pass as women should be included because they will have been treated as women in a way that is disadvantaging. So possibly there's a case for some um, instances of affirmative action, but not where this in involves an unfair advantage like in women's sport. And whether passing trans women known to be trans should be included in affirmative action measures might also need further discussion given that it's not clear whether this will have the relevant effects of providing new role models or challenging norms about what people of one sex can do or compensating for past disadvantage. It may not even reduce male centrism in decision making or products and services if the trans woman is not particularly well informed about women's interests. And I would note that a lot of the activism we see from trans women at the moment is specifically about trans issues, not about women's issues more broadly. The final thing I wanted to talk about in this debate is the procedural question of how the shift from sex to gender identity is accomplished. In the UK, things are a bit different too here in Australia. Instead of changing the legal understanding of sex to accommodate gender identity, they instead have a gender recognition certificate and having one means one should be treated as one identifies for most purposes. The requirements for getting a gender recognition certificate are that you have to have a diagnosis of gender dysphoria and have lived for two years in the gender you wish to acquire. This is a kind of middle ground policy between the one Victoria used to have, sex reassignment surgery, and the one it has now, statutory declaration of believed sex. When they proposed shifting from this understanding of legal gender, they had a public consultation. This ran for nearly four months and allowed people to make submissions. There was fierce public debate over that period about the shift, and it went on long after the consultation ended. Multiple independent women's groups sprang up in defense of sex-based rights, including A Women's Place UK, Fair Play for Women, Resisters, 
For Women Scotland, Standing for Women and more. The debate has only quietened down very recently after the government announced that it would not be changing the law. This was procedurally fair. A big change was proposed and it was opened up to the public for democratic discussion. Most importantly, women who would be hugely affected by the change were given a chance to state their objections. And the UK's change wouldn't even have been as significant as ours is here because they at least in principle have kept sex and gender distinct. What happened in Victoria and Tasmania, where there is also sex by statutory declaration, was very different. There was no public consultation. Women's groups were not consulted as stakeholders. Women more generally had no opportunity to state their objections. The whole thing was done so quietly that virtually no one even heard about it. In Victoria, there was little over two months between the bill being introduced into Parliament and then going through the final reading. There was a very little commentary in the media. Any discussion was presented as a gain for transgender people at no cost to anyone else. Any attempt to discuss the conflict of interest between women and trans women based on the bill's compromise of sex-based rights was branded as transphobic. Compare this against the fact that when there was a possibility of gay marriage, we had a postal ballot in which everyone eligible got to vote at a cost of $80.5 million. Or compare that recently when a change was proposed in Victoria to the law around vilification to shift from protecting only race and religion to also protecting other social groups, it went immediately to parliamentary committee for further consideration. The Victorian government had a consultation and welcomed submissions and invited some people who made submissions to come to a parliamentary hearing and give further evidence. Arguably, both of these issues are less consequential than changing the entire legal meaning of sex from biology or altered physiology to mere identity and with all the related implications that has. One explanation for why we have a postal ballot and a careful consultation about marriage and vilification is that there is a better public understanding of the different interests at stake and why they matter. There is a lot less clarity and a lot more heat in the debate over legal and social protections for gender identity. And this situation is worsened by the number of women who are willing to throw away any consideration of themselves as a sex class in order to be inclusive. So it wasn't even that when they attempted to slip this bill through without notice, all the women who did notice were angry about it. Some of them weren't because they'd already brought into the idea that gender identity is the only thing that could possibly matter, as though the way a man feels is more important than the actual lifetime physical experience a woman has had. We should not replace sex with gender identity in law or policy. Sex is important, a range of important interests are protected by tracking sex, as we have seen. If and where gender identity can be shown to also be important, then we should consider protecting it separately in the law or consider policies that accommodate gender identity without compromising sex-based interests. If we're going to even consider shifting from sex to gender identity in the law, then this should only be done after wide public consultation in which women are given a chance to voice their objections. And this is not achieved if women who try to voice their objections are fearful that they will lose their jobs or be sanctioned in other ways if they do so. And unfortunately, this is the climate that many people feel we're in at the moment. And that compromises democratic deliberation by suppressing the breadth of reasons and extent of support for each side. These reflections help to show, I think, that the legal situation we have now in Victoria is unjust. Sex-based rights have been compromised without women being given any say in the matter at all. Consider this a kind of appendix to the talk. Um, so what you can see here are the examples that I've already given um, at each of the three levels. And this is um, a more exhaustive, but still not exhaustive, less developed in collaboration with the Coalition for Biological Reality, which is a new bipartisan coalition uh, group in Australia. Um, that was formed with the intention of combating uh, the sort of legal and political threat of gender identity ideology. Um, 
So this is really just to give you a sense of how much more there is to say uh, about the issue of um, gender identity being um, in tension with and posing a, a threat to um, uh, sex-based interests. So at the international level, for example, um, of course, I mentioned women's rugby and the IOC, but there's all uh, international sports more generally. Um, there's the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, protection of freedom of opinion and expression. And of course, we're seeing a compromise at the moment to uh, feminist um, opinion and expression in particular. Uh, this, um, uh, our interest in protecting and advancing uh, sex-based rights and thinking of women as a sex class. There's compromise to international um, data collection and the monitoring of women's rights and women's equality progress based on sex if we were to shift to gender identity instead. There are impacts on knowledge in the way that if we shift from sex to gender identity, we end up rewriting or altering the historical record, which compromises the truth of that record. Dropping down to the national level, there are worries about distorting data if we move away from sex and toward gender identity in things like uh, drug trials. There's the compromise to women only health services. Um, so to uh, reproduction clinics, abortion clinics, rape crisis centers, and so on. There's a threat to uh, LGB advocacy groups. So these groups traditionally understanding their own orientations as being based on sex and wanting to advocate for their interests in the way that they understand them. And this has been compromised by the, um, by the push to move towards gender identity and rewrite these orientations as same gender attractions. There are issues to do with education programs in schools, so what they're teaching about gender identities as opposed to sexes and the possible implications that's going to have for girls' sexual and personal boundaries. So um, consider the way that they might understand their sexualities, for example, and then the conflicting messaging that, that, that they're getting um, in terms of gender identities instead. There are impacts on uh, policing and the reporting of crime. So, for example, um, in police departments following gender identity policy may advertise for community help in locating a suspect if that suspect is described according to his gender identity rather than his sex. Um, and this is, there's been some examples of this happening already, so that compromises um, both policing and public safety. There's the issue of insult to victims of crime. So we spoke about that a little already in reference to um, the protections in the Victorian Act, um, but it's, uh, it's not clear that those um, provisions will always be used even here where they exist and they may not exist in other uh, jurisdictions where self-ID is introduced. Um, so if you've suffered from uh, male violence, male sexual violence, and then your assailant um, claims to be a woman and it is able to even be located in women-only spaces that you frequent. Um, that seems like a particular insult uh, over and above the things we've already um, uh, worried about. Then there's the compromise to um, affirmative action programs that have been designed specifically to um, remedy women's underrepresentation in particular areas or um, sort of uh, address the fact of their historical exclusion. So this is going to include things like grants, scholarships, um, women-only shortlists, things like that. Then, as I already mentioned, at the international level and as holds at all levels, there's the issue of women's sports being traditionally sex segregated and, uh, and that being so according to fairness. There's the worry that the sex-based heuristics that women use in order to keep themselves safe, so reacting differently around men than women, are going to be compromised with lots of messaging telling us that we should instead be deferring to gender identities uh, rather than sexes. And there's a worry that there's a serious compromise to dem democracy. So for the reason that a lot of the protections that have been passed in the past based, uh, were based on sex, and now we're simply rewriting them by changing our understanding of the word woman. So protections for women understood as a sex class uh, exist in the law. And now without any democratic deliberation or discussion, we're simply changing their meaning and including a whole bunch of men as well. Dropping down to the local level, there's the fact that we will have a legal right in a particular state against indecent exposure. 
um, but some of these new exemptions in the SDA or the Equal Opportunity Act, as I talked about earlier, um, tell us that we should be including people even in spaces involving nudity on the basis of gender identities rather than sexes. And so that's going to come into conflict with women's uh, legal right against uh, indecent exposure. There's going to be a question of how those two um, uh, get worked out. Then, of course, I mentioned doctors, clinics and hospitals already, but there's also the issue of being able to um, be in a single sex ward in a hospital and how even if those wards exist, if they're run on the basis of gender identity, they're still going to be by default mixed sex. Again, at this level, there's a compromise to women's sports. Um, so I mentioned that in our Equal Opportunity Act, there's only the ability to exclude on the basis of sex and gender identity in elite sports. So that means all of the amateur sports uh, uh, lack the permission to do that. But of course, amateur sports are a pipeline into elite sports. So there's a worry that that will be a serious compromise to the integrity of women's sports overall. There are impacts on medical treatment. Um, so, for example, if we shift to a, a general social kind of approach to caring about gender identity rather than sex, then there could be uh, medical mistreatment and misdiagnosis because we're not tracking the thing that actually makes a difference to uh, people's health outcomes. There's the worry about having impacts, uh, which I mentioned already earlier, uh, on gay kids, autistic kids, and kids that are dealing with impacts of sexual objectification by deferring to them on their claims about their gender identities when that's not really uh, what's going on with them and where tracking uh, sex in a sensible way um, would be more in their interests. And finally, there's the threat to women's political organizing um, and capacity to advance what they see as their political interests if they are forced in at least some cases um, to include uh, on the basis of gender identity uh, rather than sex on pain of having discrimination suits. Um, so this is going to be a compromise to women's ability to assemble and associate together in groups of um, uh, female people to talk about their interests as a sex class. So this list still isn't comprehensive, but at least it gives you more of an example of just how much more there is to say on the question of replacing sex uh, with gender identity in uh, policy and law.